Background to this is it's uh, based on a co-funded uh, project uh, from the ESRC and Beyond Foods, who are a large uh, Dutch cooperative. Uh, we published this as a free uh, public interest report, time to bring it home the bacon, which was a couple of years ago now. Um, but we further extended this analysis in our new book, which is The End of the Experiment, which looks further at uh, dairy supply chains. And also what I'm working on at the moment is thinking about how these supermarket pressures percolate down supply chains and create situations where fraudulent activity may proliferate. The structure of this presentation is relatively straightforward. Uh, first of all, I'm going to uh, discuss the crisis in British pig meat, pig meat various indicators which uh, show you how stressed the sector is and how it underperforms European counterparts. Some conventional explanations as to why that might be, and then Andrew is going to come in and offer some alternative explanations discussing pressures around the supermarket business model. Now, this is uh, two sets of two graphs, really, which explain partly the situation of uh, the UK pig market. Uh, the interesting point here is that although this is the pig market, pig meat market sector, it could be any number of sectors in the UK, uh, not just in agriculture, but uh, in manufacturing more, more broadly. The red line up here is the self-sufficiency of the EU27 countries, so that is they are almost entirely self-sufficient in terms of the production of uh, pig meat. The black line here, as you might suspect, is the performance of uh, the British industry, so increasingly insufficient, we rely more and more on imports to uh, meet the demand from uh, UK customers, and that's really borne out in the second graph. The red line here is UK imports, the grey line here is UK exports. Um, so we have a situation where uh, British farmers are, for whatever reason, unable to meet the growing demands from British consumers for this uh, for all products. This is UK consumption of pig meat in thousands of hundreds of no, in thousands of tons up here. So you can see there has been a certain switch towards eating pork-based products in the UK. Um, but you would think that this would represent a massive opportunity. Uh, it's one that we haven't been able to capitalize on. And indeed what you're seeing at the same time is, is a rather unusual uh, kind of development, which is actually our investment in this area has, has been declining whilst consumption has been increasing. So this is fixed capital formation in UK pig farming. It's been declining whilst the market has been relatively buoyant. <clears throat> so as I said, um, this is quite a familiar set of graphs. We could have done this for any number of sectors. Um, what's interesting about this case, uh, I do accept that there are areas where low cost and low wage competition kind of kick in, but what's quite unusual about this is that we're losing share not to low wage Eastern Europe or even Asia, but actually to quite high wage countries like Denmark and the Netherlands. Now there has been a growing consensus within policy, uh, also articulated by representatives of the, of the industry, supermarket industry, as to why, how you explain this seeming paradox that we're losing out in a buoyant market to relatively high wage competitors. Uh, the story that's told is that we suffer from the strong pound and this disadvantages us, that we've had a number of disease outbreaks which has put fear uh, uh, in the market for British uh, food and that we are constrained by animal welfare laws, just closely by the sound stores and all the rest. But they don't easily map on to the kinds of graphs that I, I just put on, there is a uh, prolonged decline, and that's quite puzzling because there's no obvious, uh, this is not due to any lack of obvious competitive advantage. We don't suffer climactically, geographically, it's not about our factors of production that were mentioned earlier. Uh, wages in Denmark and the Netherlands in these sectors are nearly double that of the UK. So, how do we reframe the way we understand the problems here? Um, our answer is that we need to think about supermarket uh, business model and what pressures this kind of pushes through uh, the, the sector in, in, in such a way that it dis disadvantages uh, our ability to capitalise on some of these trends. Um, the first point that we make is that supermarkets not only compete in the product market, they compete in the capital market. 
They are, at the same time, competing on shelf price to consumers, but they're also trying to deliver shareholder value to uh, their shareholders. The second point that we make is that uh, there's also pressure within, within this kind of general context of, of competition and uh, attempts to deliver to shareholders kind of a financial characteristic of supermarkets. So they have very high purchase to sales ratio, about 85, 90% of every pound spent goes on purchased uh, inputs. So high purchase to sales ratio, what that encourages then is uh, uh, an attempt to reduce the purchase to sales ratio to try and release more profit. Third, more contingent um, aspect of this is that there's also additional pressure on the supermarkets for a couple of reasons, partly their own uh, strategic endeavours over this period of time. Uh, massive capital spending spree to try and expand the store footprint, which has left them with a number of legacy costs. And also the more recent entry of deep discounters, which have further uh, undermined their ability to generate profit. So what you have is a supermarket business model that has increasingly focused on uh, extracting margin from their supply chain. That is, putting more and more and more pressure on the processors and other food suppliers immediately beneath them to try and extract profit from uh, these, uh, these different goods. The way that they've done that um, are manifold, um, they are using quite clearly their position of power in the supply chain as a kind of a gateway to the consumer uh, against food producers who, who lack brands. And this enables very aggressive trading tactics to emerge in an attempt to push profits up the chain and pass risk uh, back down. And these are four examples that we found that they are by no means the only uh, levers that they are pulling at this point in time. First of all, flexible supply agreements. Um, you might think that supermarkets were the bastion of, of neoliberal kind of capitalism. Well, uh, this is not a particularly contractualist uh, situation that you have here. There's lots of uh, the renegotiation that goes on at the expense of the immediate suppliers, and this creates constant uncertainty at that intermediate level. There's also the frequent threat of supply switching which although it happens very rarely, it's used as kind of leverage. If you don't supply us this stuff at this price, then we'll find someone who can. Um, when they do actually switch, the, the, the results are absolutely devastating uh, on that level. Probably a, a, an annual loss book for that year. You have one-way open book accounting, and what this does is it enables supermarkets to monitor supplier margins, so they constantly know how much money they're making, and therefore they can give them a bit more of a squeeze uh, the next time around. Uh, although producers remain relatively unclear about supermarket costs. And there's also the forced funding of promotions, so that when supermarkets decide to do two-for-one deals and all the rest of it, uh, the phone call goes to the supplier and say, we're going to do this next week, and this is what we're going to pay you. Um, second part of this um alternative explanation for why there's this dysfunction in, in the UK pig sector is that this, um, this kind of uh, aggressive pathological behaviour from the supermarkets isn't confined to the supermarkets. It spreads throughout the supply chain as everyone else adapts to it. So this is uh, across uh, processors, farmers and supermarkets. You tend to get a very adversarial approach to transactions where you're always looking to undercut everyone else as much as you can and you're looking uh, with a very short-term perspective on things like capital investment, uh, innovation and employment which I'll come back to. But what you're left with is, is a sector where all the key players are basically focused on dealing, on trying to get the best deal across markets rather than focusing on making their operations more efficient uh, making them more technologically sound or more environmentally sound, if they were that way inclined. Um, so what are the impacts? Well, first of all, there's um, a negative impact in trading patterns. So what processors are dealing with is very unstable demand from the supermarkets. They're not really able to look very far ahead. They're uh, under constant pressure 
And so this leads them to, first of all, distress sell their inventories, so dumping produce on the market at low cost. Um, and it also leads them to have to become very opportunist in the way they source meat for their factories. So they're constantly having to look around the EU to get the best deal. And uh, we wrote this before the horse meat scandal took place, but we weren't particularly surprised, to be honest, uh, when it did come out, because there is this constant we were dealing going on. Um, and then thirdly, the, it leads to processes pushing the pressure down the chain to farmers. So the second set of impacts, well, it, it locks in operational inefficiency and it passes the burden of the supermarket's business model onto labour. So I'll cover but what, what I mean by this. Um, well, because there's constant order churn, constant uncertainty about demand, then uh, a lot of the processes aren't really able to fully utilise their capacity in their plants. And that means they're not always inclined to invest large amounts of money in new capital equipment. Um, so productive investment is discouraged. Instead, the safe strategy is to have a cheap and flexible labour force. Rather than making your operations more technologically advanced, you get uh, migrant labour on uh, temporary contracts and you shrink and expand the labour force according to how things are going. So they adopt a very short-term uh, attitude towards the labour force, low-skilled labour, um, very poor conditions. Uh, we didn't look directly at working conditions, but uh, other studies uh, we did look at found that meat processing had some of the very worst labour conditions in the manufacturing sector. And um, it also has a range of wider social costs because you get these kind of, when orders do switch, these farcical uh, situations where a factory is closing in one area and opening up in another. Um, and often in high unemployment areas. So, just the final point is, um, is there anything economically inevitable about this situation? Do supermarkets have to behave in this way? Um, and is it inevitable that a supply chain becomes organised like this, given that supermarkets are so powerful? Well, what, what we found was, was no, actually, because um, Morrison's uh, quite quietly operates uh, much of its own meat supply chain in a completely different way to the one which I've just described. And we, we had a bit of a look at this. So the two charts on the left here um, is looking at the distribution of value added, so the total wealth which a company creates once it's um, paid for the cost of production. Um, and um, I'll explain this. So Morrison's, instead of uh, running a, a vertically disintegrated supply chain where you're switching suppliers and sourcing from here, there and everywhere, they, they own their own suppliers in several of their key product areas, meat being one of them. And um, what this allows uh, the companies that Morrison's owns to do is to fully load their plants. They have full capacity utilisation, and that means they start to generate um, an awful lot of cash from their operations. So uh, the red line company X in both cases is um, Morrison's uh, vertically integrated supplier, and the other three lines um, are the UK's uh, other big, three biggest uh, pig meat processors, which we use as a comparison. And in both cases, um, Morrison's one stands out. So at the top there, it's got a low labour share of value added, and that's not because they're paying lower wages. Um, it's because they're running their plants more efficiently. They're producing a very high cash flow share of value added. Now, what you do with this cash uh, depends upon the priorities of the company. But the point is, is that they're... Uh, there's no kind of economic um, necessity about supermarkets running their supply chain like this. It's a cultural choice, and it's to do with the kind of competencies which supermarkets have, where, for instance, Morrisons have uh, manufacturers and engineers sitting on their board, whereas Tesco's and other supermarkets are built around traders, have a trader mentality. Um, so that's it, I think. Uh, <laughs>